Well, welcome to Focal Point, uh, another class here where we're diving a little deeper into God's Word on various topics, various beliefs. Today, it's about creation. And so we're going to uh, take a look at some different perspectives, but most of all, and most importantly, what God's Word has to say about the earth and its origins, and our origin for that, uh, uh, for that matter. Let's start with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for your blessings today and on your Sabbath. We just give ourselves to you. Our eyes are wide open. Our ears are listening to hear. Uh, Father, send your spirit to speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. There is a, it's a challenge today, um, talking about origins, talking about um, where do we come from? How did life begin? Uh, in this modernistic society, some people call it postmoderns, others, uh, there's some different terminology out there for it. But regardless, there's a different culture today, a different set of ears listening, a different worldview and perspective. And it's a challenge for churches to be able to convey uh, and, and share what God's word has to say about the earth, about mankind and our origins. So modernism has a significant uh, impact on our evangelistic efforts or our efforts to share our faith in this context. But we do know one thing that as Christians, we walk by faith, not by sight. And this is probably one of the sig most significant paradigm differences that we have from a secularist or an atheist or someone else that is seeing things through different, a different lens. Hebrews 11.3 says that by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So the, in other words, the things that you see is not made with something that's visible, something that is, is empirically provable under tests or labs or anything else. Because it is by faith that we understand that the worlds were framed. Of course, here uh, we understand there's a bigger context to creation. It's not just this world, but God who created the universe. And I believe also other inhabited worlds that are unfallen and untainted by, by sin. This next quote comes from a book called Christ Object Lessons, a fantastic book, uh, basically looking at the parables of Jesus. And um, the author, Ellen White, makes this statement in regard to the truths of the Word of God and how to find those truths. She says, The great storehouse of truth is the Word of God. The written Word, the book of nature, and the book of experience in God's dealing with human life. So notice here that we do follow the word. The word of God is supreme. We have a sola scriptura foundation in our belief system. Yet also our, our understanding of things is formed by not just the word of God, although the word of God is the supreme authority by which we measure other things, but also the, the book of nature and the book of experience that all of us have as Christians. So what we see in nature helps to inform us of the God that we believe in. What we experience in life, in relationships, uh, in the love that we have for uh, others within our family, within our friendships, it reveals a God that is, is there and caring for us. Um, she goes on, here are the treasures from which God's workers are to draw. So this is where we need to focus our attention as to finding truth, God's word, which includes Book of Nature as well, and then, of course, our experience. In the search after truth, they are to depend upon God, <clears throat> not upon human intelligences, the great men whose wisdom is foolishness with God. Through his own appointed channels, the Lord will impart knowledge of himself to every seeker. A significant part of that, what I, I gather from this last statement here, is that if, if you don't honestly seek God, you will not find truth. If you just say, no, he doesn't exist, no, everything was created by natural causes, Big Bang, how, whatever th other theory you have within the evolutionary model, 
then you will never actually have a chance to see through through the eyes of a follower of Christ, which is God in everything. He created nature, our experience with him, uh, in our walking with him. And so um, uh, it's, it truly is a different paradigm, as you can see, for the Christian and for those that are uh, have a secular worldview. As Christians, as we said, we walk by faith, not by sight. You might say another word for sight in that context is facts. We don't live by what we see factually, but we live by faith. Uh, Even just a simple example, when I get in my car in the morning, I have faith that when I push the button, it starts. Or when you turn the key, it starts. I don't have to see, open the hood and watch the starter actually engage when I push the button. I just believe, boom, when I do it, it will happen. The experience there tells me that the car is doing its job. So is the starter, so are the pistons that ignite and and the engine that gets started. Um, There there exists no empirical proof about the origin of the earth. At one end of the line is faith, and at the other end is fact. The more we move toward fact, the less we trust by faith the less we see the Bible as authoritative. Authority is not in the facts. If we believe that it is, we will end up arguing whose facts are better to no avail. avail. This is not to say that there's no room for proving Scripture, just that it doesn't work with the secular mind of the moderns. The Western world has produced an environment of suspicions to the point that argument is merely an expression of opinion. Add to this that today's moderns are moved more by feelings rather than facts. So it makes a significant challenge to reach out to those with a different perspective where feelings and emotions are more involved and and facts are so readily uh, received and understood. I, I think that's one of the reasons why fake news is so successful is that people read something and they go, oh man, and then they they just jump on the bandwagon. And then they'll read something else, oh, oh, uh, yeah, look at that. And we tend to read only the things that support what our opinion is in the first place, rather than reading what the other perspective might be. So it really comes, uh, it becomes a challenge here when you're talking about uh, uh, creation versus evolution. If you have that model that's ingrained in you as an evolutionary model, you're not inclined to read anything really uh, as a serious seeker about um, creation and uh, to actually see the legitimacy of those things. Now, there are some that have. Absolutely, I don't discount that at all because we have had many testimonies where people that were formerly evolutionists have become creationists because they finally honestly dove into that, um, uh, uh, you know, that specific Uh, perspective to find out if this in fact is truth and that's really what it takes and what what I'm arguing here one of the worst things we can do is get caught up with arguing biblical facts this is the Christian way of using the scientific method for proving everything do you ever meet anybody that wants to prove to you from various texts their perspective it's really a scientific way it's a scientific model of proving someone wrong and ourselves right. <clears throat> so, this is the Christian way of using the scientific method for proving everything. The result is never what is intended. Instead of the authority of the Bible takes a hit. There needs to be a balance of providing sufficient evidence without intending to prove everything. So, in other words, even in the, in the Christian world, as we uh, study the Bible and we share our faith with others, there is a room, there is room enough there for some difference of opinion. We don't have to be dogmatic in our views. Now, there are also basic uh, essential pillars of our faith. There are certain things in Scripture that are so clear that you cannot deny. And that's, I think, uh, one of the significant things that formed, uh, informed the Adventist Church and our set of doctrines. We see, we have a, a, a hermeneutic, 
a way of looking at Scripture and understanding what it says and matching Scripture with Scripture that, brought, that brings to life this system of truth. Not just individualized, isolated truths after a few verses, but a whole system that works together. And uh, we don't have to argue that. We have to live it. Uh, for those in moderns today that have more of a feeling and emotional perspective, they're driven more by that, what you'll find is that stories and testimonies have a much greater impact on changing their views rather than arguing the facts. Because an argument of facts is simply someone else's opinion. And so we want to make sure that we are reaching them and touching them through God's methods. Naturalists and atheists want to pit science against faith. You may have been seeing some of this. <clears throat> but in reality, there are numerous assumptions in the evolutionary, evolutionary model. That's one of the reasons why they call it the theory of evolution. That theory continues to adapt and change. And every time they make an assumption, they will call it an assumption. But what we call it is they're taking a step of faith. They're putting their faith in this assumption that then gets them to a conclusion that gets them what they're looking for. Whereas as a Christian, we just simply say, we don't know everything. We don't know how many of these things came into existence. But the more we search into it, the more we look into it, the more we see that it's coming together and that God's word is absolutely true. It's being confirmed by the evidence that we're finding in the creationist uh, model. So what does the Bible say about Earth's origin? All right, let's take a look at that here from Genesis 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, and the dot, dot, dot is the days of creation. And we'll take a brief look at the days of creation here in just a moment. But there are only two creations mentioned in the Bible. There's a general creation of the universe. And we know that even within that, other worlds as they are created, they have their own special creations. But I'm talking about just in, in our, our worldview, our perspective, our corner of the universe, you might say, there was a general uh, creation, which is the stars and those kinds of things. And then there was a special creation of this earth. The general creation produced the earth without form and void. So it was there. It was sitting there. Special creation or specific creation brought forth the living things on the earth. Does that make sense? Okay. So uh, sometimes, you know, I hear some people arguing over how old dirt is and things. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I know there are a lot of problems with the methods and carbon dating and other things like that. But to me, it doesn't really matter how old a rock is because to me, the biggest rock has been there for I don't know how long. We're not told. Just that it existed, that there was an ocean, the deep, and that uh, God's spirit began to move at creation. In verse 16, it says that God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Now, the syntax for this fourth day, um, and, and I, I know I'm jumping ahead a bit, and I'll come back, but this is one of the questions some have with regard uh, to creating light. You know, the rest of the first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day is all fairly clear and understandable, but this one part some people struggle with, so which is why I'm sharing this. But the syntax for what happens on this fourth day does not support that the stars were made actually on that day but that the stars were made in the same way that God created the sun and the moon. Uh, God made the galaxy, including our solar system, before Earth's special creation. Now, we don't know all the specifics of this because we weren't there, but this seems to be indicated in Scripture as to uh, how uh, Moses, inspired by uh, God's Spirit, wrote Genesis and... Um, and the story of creation. So now let's take a look here briefly at the, uh, the six days of creation and then the seventh day, which God set aside as the Sabbath. 
So you'll, you'll find here kind of a, um, well, what do you call it? It's, it's kind of a parallelism between the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth days. So whereas the first day light was created and the fourth day God put into to the sky the sun and the moon, which brings light to the earth. On the second day, water and sky. And then on the fifth day, he filled the water and the sky with the fish and the birds. And then on the third day, he creates land, vegetation, which was for food. And only after that is done could he create on the sixth day animals and man because they were sustained by living on land and by the vegetation that was eaten. So do you see kind of this parallel of the six days of creation? First, God fills it, or excuse me, forms it as a space or as an element, and then he fills it with substance or inhabitants. So verses 3 through 30 uh, this method here actually reverses the form, the, the voidness or the, the, the nothingness that existed on this earth. Now, the seventh day was a combination of forming and filling. So on the seventh day, he formed a place in time. He said, this is a sacred day. This is a day that is holy. And then... He filled it with his presence, and that's what brought holiness into this day. And it helps to us, uh, for us to understand this because as human beings, what that is telling us <clears throat> is that man was created on the sixth day, but the seventh day, man was intended to come into the presence of God and to be uh, in inspired by his holiness, to receive his holiness and uh, allow that to sustain us and help us in life. It also uh, very much informs uh, uh, any reader here that God is not just a God that is distant, but he's relational. He's drawing close. He's creating a space in time to spend time with his creation. The culmination of the creation story is not the sixth day, but the seventh. If it had ended on the sixth day, the high point would have been the creation of man. That would have been it. But it is not. The high point is the Sabbath because everything in the Bible is about what God is doing, not what man is doing. He established a day for God's presence in man, whom he made in his image. And then in regard to the filling, holiness is not separation from, but separation to you know, we often think of separation as pushing apart, right? But the context of like sanctification, set apart, or separation, that is a not a from, but a to God. In other words, separation from the world around us to God who made us. The Sabbath is holy when it is separated to God. The same with all sacred things that are set apart for a holy purpose. In Moses' case, the place where he was standing was holy because of what? God's presence, okay? So we must ask the question, did God create in six or seven days? Well, um, the answer is kind of both. <laughs> it depends on what, you look, what you're looking at. Um, uh, the things and the space and all, the, all that stuff, six days. It's a six-day, literal six-day creation. We'll talk about literal here in just a minute. Uh, but the seventh day was also a day that he created or that he made into something. And so that's why uh, Jesus talks about that in Mark 2, 27. We'll read that verse here in just a minute. But notice this, Genesis 2, 1 and 2. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. So in one respect, all the creation was done in six days and it was finished. But then God ended his work, that's the work of creating in six days, and then he rested on the seventh day. But Jesus talk, talked about this rest as something that God made. So he made something quite different on the seventh day than he did on those first six days because the Sabbath was made for man 
and not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is made for man to connect with his creator and to receive from him sustenance, spiritual sustenance, that would get him through the next week of work and activities that, um, that he engaged in. Did God create in seven literal or figurative days? Because this is one of the debates within Christianity. Um, theistic evolution is a way to put a stamp of God on the evolutionary model. And to me, it's a, it's a bit of a cop-out. Because if you read the text, what you will discover is that it leaves no question that God created in six literal days. There is no question. And let's, so let's go through that here. How do we know this? Number one, the word used for day, which is yom. That is coupled with an ordinary number. So when it, is, it has a number next to it, it always refers to a literal 24-hour day. Not just in biblical writings, but in extra-biblical material of writings in those days. When you, compare, when you put yom with a number, it's always literal. There's nothing figurative about it. The next one is the literary genre. Uh, Genesis 2 verse 4 refers to it as an historical, or tolada, translated as account or genealogy of the earth. So it's an historical event. It's meant to reveal exactly what happened historically and as a genealogy. Um, what genealogy was ever figurative? You know, I, I, I lived for... 65 years, but that was figurative. <laughs> it doesn't work, right? Uh, so, yes, so we have a, a very historical account here in Genesis chapter 1. Um, there are 10 genealogies that play a key role in the veracity of the book's history as well as family ancestry. If all of these genealogies are factual and historical, how can you argue that the Earth's genealogy is not? Okay, so see when you compare the two, you start to see that there's a very li there's a literalness in this genre of language of this genre of writing, and uh, it is it is always literal when it's speaking of historical or geo uh, geologies or genealogies, excuse me, um, in their accounts of ancestry. Number three, syntax. The phrases evening and morning are used repeatedly, denoting a single literal day. So when you hear evening and morning, if it's not in the context of, prof of prophecy, it's referring to a specific literal day. And then lastly, number four, the inter intertextuality. Uh, that is the context in which other scripture passages and authors use the creation account. So what, what I'm saying here is that, uh, uh, for instance, in Exodus 20, verses 8 through 12, the Sabbath command, the days are literal spoken by God. Uh, in fact, the, the only thing in this world that we have found that began us recognizing a week is the creation account. Because the moon helps to reveal which kind of system, the, the lunar system, which is our months, right? The sun tells us what? It reveals what kind of a, how do we measure time with the sun? Years, okay? But what space or what body is revealing that we have a week, a weekly system of seven days? Only the creation account. There is no other basis for it. So how long did God, how long ago, excuse me, did God create the earth? Well, according to, there actually are, are enough biblical genealogies in here where we can estimate the age of the earth. So if we take those as literal accounts, historical accounts or genealogies, and the creation account is also an historical or a genealogy of the earth, so to speak, of its creation, then we can discover here at least a close up or a proximity of the age of the earth. And many have done this throughout history. It's not just one or two men. You'll find over and over again those that using different passages and texts, they all arrive at close to, within a few hundred years, uh, the same dates or length of, of time for the age of the earth. 
So according to genealogies, we have from Adam to Abraham, revealed there in Genesis 5 and 11, 2,000 years, roughly, okay? Then we have from Abraham to Jesus, about 2,000 years. Now, Matthew 1 doesn't reveal the ages of the different genealogies or different individuals in that genealogy. But as you estimate the approximate ages of a generation and adding to that, of course, people that live a little longer, um, you find it's about 2,000 years. Uh, more than that, though, uh, what we, we know historically that has been established is that um, Abraham uh, not only is a real figure, but he lived about 2,000 years. And this is 2,000 years before Christ. And this isn't just a biblical thing. This is an actual historical account by secularists or historians. <clears throat> All right. Um, then the last one is Jesus until today, uh, about 2,000 years. And so we know that the approximate age of the earth is 6,000 plus. Now, we know that it's also probably a little older than 6,000 years now because we're entering into uh, a period beyond that, um, uh, you know, 2,000th year or the second millennium AD. And uh, I see that as the answer to that as more of a tearing of God in his plan for the redemption of, of mankind. Um, let's go on here and I'll share a couple other things that will tie into this. In 2 Peter 3, it says, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Now, some believe that God is following a timeline in his plan of salvation that includes 6,000 years of the earth in labor for deliverance from sin. That is followed by a 7,000 year period of a millennial rest. In other words, a 7,000 year period, not 7,000 more years. This is a Sabbath rest that is happening. And there, not only do they get that from this passage, although I think it's a little bit of, of an inference they're putting into this, because there's no proof that God's on this 6,000 plus 1,000 year plan for redeeming man and then having him rest in that last. But it certainly is possible. We also find uh, this passage here, from Hebrews 4, 6 through 9. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and it's talking about a rest, and those to whom it must first be first preached did not enter it because of disobedience. Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, today, after such a long time, as it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And then he says, for if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Did Joshua take the children of Israel into the promised land? Yes. But it says here that he actually did not give him the rest that God designed. He gave them a figure or a picture or an experience of rest. Because it says in verse 9, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. It is a type of rest the land of Canaan dwelling, the land that they dwelled in, a type of rest that would happen in the last days when Christ would come back and take his people to be with him in heaven. Speaking of a millennial rest with him. So again, so this passage also kind of informs that, hey, it could be that God is in a general plan of 6,000 years plus 1,000 years of rest, but we can't say that dogmatically or, or emphatically. We just, we don't know but there seems to be some indication that that is possible, that that is happening. That's what he's doing. All right. God in his creation is a God of relationships. Okay? He didn't create as some who are um, agnostics and then just step back and let the world just do what it's going to do. He actually stays involved in this world because he's he created it and he loves what he created, even though it is significantly um, less and fallen from the condition that it was in when he first created it. It says in Genesis 1.26 that God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, 
Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So as we saw earlier in, in the, the hierarchy or the creation uh, pattern, that there is a hierarchy and that it was a buildup to the creation of man. And we'll look at that here in just a minute as to what God did differently with the creation of mankind than he did with the animals or the birds or the fish. Uh, but why, why does God love his creation so much? Well, one of the reasons is that we find that he, he gave us, we were made in his image, in his likeness. Now, if you have kids, they were born in your likeness. And there's something about loving your kids more than the other kids. <laughs> it's just because they're your kids. And in, in almost every respect, God sees this earth full of people as his kids. And he's just trying to get them back to the original design that he had for them when he created this world, to bring them back to perfection and to eradicate sin and the devil and all that he's doing as well. It says in Genesis 2, verse 7, the very next chapter, And the Lord God formed a man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So the creation of man was a much more of an intimate process than God went through in creating the animals. Because if you remember, the rest of the creation was created as God spoke, right? But here God doesn't speak man into existence. Instead, he gets down, you can picture this, gets down on his knees and he gathers the, the material from the earth that he needs and he forms mankind. And as he, after he forms mankind, then what does he do? He gets down really close, right into his nostrils. And he breathes life into, into Adam. And Adam wakes up. What's the first thing Adam sees? His creator. This close. Um, what an amazing thing that would have been, huh? But, uh, but Adam here experiences or sees God first because God was his creator. And, of course, we see later in the story, and we'll talk about this as well in just a few minutes, that um, Eve, of course, is created from the side of Adam, and he has then a companion uh, with him. But one of the things I really want to point out here in this passage is that in chapter 1, you find, and in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And it says, and God said, and God said, and God did, and so God is referred to over and over again, and his name, uh, or the, the, the title for God there is Elohim. Elohim is God. But all of a sudden, in Genesis 2, beginning in actually verse 4, it goes from God, it's just Elohim, to the Lord God. Yahweh Elohim. So one of the reasons you see in a lot of translations of Scripture, the Lord is capitalized, that's Yahweh. That's Yahweh as in God's name. So we find that God isn't just a distant Elohim, God who is all powerful, all creative, can do everything. We find a personal God, he has a name. Uh, think about it. The, the first thing, the beginning of every relationship, the thing that happens is you learn somebody's name. Right? You learn their name. And we even know that after you've met somebody a few times, you should know their name. And when you forget their name, you get concerned about that because you feel like they might be what? They might be offended if you don't know their name already because the relationship has already begun. So name, learning someone's name is very much the beginning of a relationship. And so God says, I'm a relational God. I'm a God of relationships. My name is Yahweh. And you can come and have an intimate relationship with me. In Psalm 139, it says, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. This is King David, by the way. He says, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. David declares the wonder of God's creative power. 
and he recognizes in himself that God created everything he is and who he is and wanted that relationship with him. And he was just awestruck by that. And today, it's the, one of the saddest things, I think, is that um, we have become so secular in our culture today. And forgetting the Sabbath and the introduction of, introduction of the evolutionary model and the origin of the species and other things that have come about have caused us to forget our origins, our creator. And uh, it's one of the reasons, I think, that we don't honor God as we should in our society uh, today. Back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. And then in verse 21, it says, The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Notice here that uh, God says there's one thing that is not good about creation. And it wasn't anything that he created that was not good. It's what he had not yet created that was not good. So that word um, not good is more, the, probably a better translation is ideal. The ideal had not been created yet. And so God then creates Adam for Adam and also Eve, uh, Adam for Eve. He creates this couple that are together. Verse 22, then the rib which the Lord had taken from, at, from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, this whole, um, uh, the word there that God made Eve, when he created Eve, he made Adam a helper. Uh, the word to help is ezer, uh, ezer in uh, the Hebrew language. But what was added to ezer in this case, in this uh, situation, was ezer konegdo, ezer konegdo, which is like Adam but opposite to him. Okay, so it's more than just to help, but to help as one like Adam but opposite to him, as in a mirror opposite. Not opposite as in conflicting opposite, but opposite as in standing opposed, but, but somewhat independent. Adam is simply acknowledging here as well her title as woman. He didn't name, he didn't identify her first as woman. Uh, in fact, God described her first as woman because she was taken from man. So in that context, Adam is simply uh, he is confirming or identifying with what God has called her, woman. And not only that, um, I think that's probably the similar context to the, the name Eve. In the Genesis account, you don't find uh, Adam being named. He just is Adam. But Eve, who is the first, who's kind of the mother of all to follow, is the same kind of, kind of a, a similar title to Adam is of man, um, that is something that God would ascribe. Because uh, some, I, I say this because some would argue, well, um, Adam identified, he named Eve as a woman and he named her as Eve and that means he's over her. Because look, all the animals he named and identified, that's not what the Bible is indicating here. He's simply acknowledging what God has already identified, has already named. Uh, the other thing, too, is neat, is that when Adam sees Eve, he speaks. His response is in poetry. It's the first poetry of Scripture. So, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. That's written in poetry. He's amazed. He sees her, and he is awestricken and speaks and responds in poetry. Then it says in verse 24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So Eve was not made from Adam's feet or Adam's head. He's made from Adam's side, showing equality. 
They were equal to each other. They were comparable, yet complementary for each other. And how many of you who, who have been married have seen that when your, your spouse and you, you can disagree uh, sometimes, but, um, but you definitely can see the differences, but you still are one. You're still together, but you have a different perspective, a different point of view. And this is the complementary thing. I also see in my wife uh, things that I don't have. She has sometimes a discernment that I don't have. Oh, you need to be careful there. And I hadn't seen it, but she could see it. And, uh, and then other things, uh, when she's trying to solve an issue or a problem, I might be helpful in that because I kind of come from a logical perspective, a rational perspective uh, in, in handling and resolving conflict or other things. Now, the text here says uh, a few things. Man will azab his parents or leave his parents. And this creates an exclusive relationship. It breaks the relationship from parent to child and creates an exclusive relationship with somebody new. They will then be, it says, dabak or to cling. They will hold to each other like glue. And this establishes a permanent relationship. So he leaves, it's exclusive, but it's also permanent. And then it says the two will be akad or one. And this is unity in spite of personality and characteristic differences. This forms an intimate relationship between the two, both physical and mental. And this is kind of the context where we have the, the biblical term to know, where Adam knew his wife or other descriptions of um, sexual relations between a uh, married couple. It's the knowledge, it's the coming together as one and an intimacy that is born from that. So we've, we've mentioned already today two divinely appointed institutions that got established at creation. What, do you, did you pick those out? Okay, he, he created the world six days, seventh day the Sabbath, but then he made man, and then he made a woman from the man, and she was his wife, he was her husband. So what are the two divinely appointed institutions that we have here? One on the seventh day, which was the Sabbath, and then between husband and wife, the institution of marriage. So marriage and Sabbath come both from the Lord. And if you've been looking around today at all, you'll find that both have come under significant attack in the day in which we live. Not only the institution of marriage, but also the Sabbath, and that, uh, that is growing more. We'll find more and more agitation of Sabbath versus Sunday coming up here, I think, in a few years to come. At least that's where it seems like things are headed very quickly. Our next question, how did God create the earth? Well, it says here that by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. So he, he spoke things into, into existence, but he also breathed life things into, or people, or, or um, things into existence. It goes on in verse 8, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. It is so hard for us to comprehend speaking something into his ex existence. This is something only God can do. And why Satan felt like he, he could somehow usurp God and step into God's position with his own world, I have no idea. He had no creative power. It's one of the reasons why the devil hates mankind so much. We can procreate. He cannot. Uh, some, uh, here's one of the things, just kind of as a sidebar. Um, in the book of Genesis, it talks about in chapter 5, I believe it is, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, and then they came together. And some have suggested that, well, this is heavenly, uh, or angels, fallen angels that were cast out of heaven, have then come down and they have um, impregnated women of the earth, creating a... a, a uh, superior species, a different species. Nephilim is, yeah, is, is the word, the term that they were used. But if you read the rest of Scripture, you'll find that that's not possible because angels were never given the ability to procreate. 
They have no ability to impregnate mankind or a woman for that matter. So that's not the term and, and the, the actual answer for that is, because I, I mentioned it, that the sons of God, which were the line of Seth, who were loyal to God and followed God, they saw the daughters of men, in other words, those that were being raised after the order of Cain and were the wicked at the time growing in number, that they crossed the line and went out and made wives out of them. And then you had a growth of wickedness more than you had a growth of holiness and purity in this earth. And so that's what was being described leading up to the need for a flood, where God sends a flood and destroys the earth. Because the wickedness, he said the, the, the uh, man's thoughts were wicked continually because of this growth of wickedness rather than um, the steadfastness of, of holiness for Seth's line. All right, Ephesians 3 verse 9, God created all things through whom? Jesus. So Jesus was not created as we learned uh, last in our last session, um, but Jesus is the creator. So God, through Christ, created all things. It says in Hebrews 1, something very similar, verses 1 and 2. God, who at various times in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. So here another reference to worlds um, that he made not just even this earth. And then John 1 verse 3 says, All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Are you starting to catch kind of the pattern here? Recognition throughout scripture that Jesus was the creator. Uh, it gives us a greater understanding of the cross, doesn't it? The creator was the one that the creation crucified. And to me, that is just unfathomable. Um, he created us, yet he let his creation that he loved and created crucify him to death. Uh. Colossians 1, sometimes this passage, this section here, is known as the Christ hymn. It says, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. So the emphasis here by Paul is that we are dependent upon Jesus for everything, not just for bringing us into existence, but also for sustaining us every day. Whether you follow him or not, he keeps you alive. You could scream at him, I don't believe you exist. He's still keeping you alive because he loves you. <clears throat> this passage we read once before, but it says the earth was without form and void and the darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. So we know that the spirit of God was also involved in creation. And so it's not just isolated, it's in just Jesus, although Jesus was the author and he was the one through which everything was created, it says the Spirit was involved. I also want to recognize that when we talk about God and creation and these kinds of things, it's something that goes beyond our comprehension. We can only talk about and and. And, and believe what we're told. But it's beyond that, we have to speculate. And we have to be careful when we speculate because we may be wrong. And so I will always try to say that this is my opinion and, um, and nothing else. Um, think about the process of building a home because you've got, uh, God also um, is in this equation of creation. So you have Father creating through the Son and then the Holy Spirit is involved. So think about, you know, the building process. You have, you have an architect. And then you have a builder that takes on the project. And then you have those that are contractors or construction companies that are doing the building. So you have various people and, and different entities involved in creating something, building something. 
And I don't know exactly how, this is maybe a very crude way of saying that the Godhead is involved in creation, but clearly the Bible is saying that all were somehow involved in creation, but Jesus was the head of, of how things were finally created. And um, <clears throat> again, I don't know exactly how to understand this process, but that's what the Bible says. Will God ever restore the world back to its original design? I believe absolutely he will. Here's what it says in Revelation 21. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I will make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. In other words, they are as good as done. Yes. Um, I mean, imagine you're in heaven after the thousand years. The new Jerusalem comes down. You're in it. You get to come out and watch Jesus create the world again. We get to see it this time and how he speaks it back into existence. And then he says, it's yours. It just, uh, it's just beyond, it, it is overwhelming. Uh, we cannot comprehend what that's going to be like, but we do know that this, this is what Christ, this is what the method is, this is what he's doing to restore uh, this world back to its original design and restore us, recreating us internally, but then giving us new flesh, a new body, and eternal life along with that when Jesus comes to take us home. <clears throat> Any questions? that you have that come up that surface from this. I want to make sure if I haven't covered something and you have a question on it, if I can answer it, I'm happy to do that. Uh, if not, that's okay. Which is, which is a comment. I, yeah. I understand when he said, God said, let us make him in our image. Mm -hmm. He is talking about you. Yeah. And that just jumps out at me when I see that. Now. Yeah. So I'm learning. There we go. You know, and I hadn't put that together right, right there too, but clearly the hour is, is more than one that's involved in creation. Of course, we know that tri he's a triune God, there's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All of them are involved in creating. And uh, yeah, beautiful picture, beautiful picture. Yeah, Jesus is the, yeah, but, but he's foundation, he's architect, he's designer, he's all the stuff, and then you could see the Holy Spirit carrying it out, you know, and then uh, God, of course, enjoying the process because he's the one that instigated or initiated creation itself, and, uh, you know, I'm just, again, okay, this is the part where I'm speculating, but to me, it is what makes sense from what scripture at least tells us. Um, we will find out uh, when Jesus comes, and of course, after being in heaven for a thousand years, exactly how this works. And I can't wait for that day. Any other questions or thoughts, comments? All right, let's pray to close. Father in heaven, uh, you have blessed us so much with your word, and through your word today, we've learned a little bit more about creation and how this world was created, how the universe was formed, and how we as, as men and women were created as well in your image Lord, we thank you for loving us so much to create us and giving us good things. And even when we don't follow you, you keep us alive. Give us an opportunity to, to repent and to confess our sins and to be saved by Jesus. And so we pray that you would, you would do that. Allow us to be able to share this wonderful news that we have of Jesus and not only his creative power, but his recreative power in us. We thank you. And we give ourselves to you as well this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless you. Have a terrific Sabbath day.